Nice to see all of you. I want to say Wolfie Latasha for keeping this alive. Oh. This is very important to our family, our children, our grandchildren. I'm now, uh, I'm now about 74 years old. So I, uh, I got a lot of grandchildren. At first I was kind of hesitant. I said, don't call me grandpa, call me uncle. <laughs> But now, I'm kind of proud of that. I lived this long. I too went to Vietnam, I came back, and I tell you, we had to come here to Wounded Knee. Before this, we were in Washington, D.C. We took over the building, BIA building for seven days. But we wasn't like Trump's people. They had a purpose in being there, they wouldn't let us to meet with the people we're supposed to, so we took over the whole building. And uh, we bought, told the people that was taking it over for seven days, you go there and upstairs and all those files, you look for the files of your reservation, where you live, of your home community. We're gonna take them with us when we leave. Cause they belong to us. All the history of the land, of the theft, of the minerals, and then we ended up coming to Wounded Knee to establish our treaty rights that we're nations of people, we're not tribes. We're nations. Oglala Lakota Nation was established right down below this hill in the teepee. The elders came together, the chiefs, the headsmen. That time we still had chiefs. And so for 71 days, we stayed here, fought him every day. You hear with this gunfire? I go all night sometimes the next day. We lost some good, good brothers. One was named Buddy Lamont. He drove this net and killed him on the highway down here because they couldn't. Couldn't beat him in a straight up man to man, so they had to shoot him. He was a boxer. He represented the old Lalas at the Pan American Games. That's how tough he was. And so they had to use a rifle to kill him, a shotgun. They shot him close, had pellets, double our buck all around his chest because we took him to the to the uh, uh, corner. We had to do an autopsy, but we made our people, we stood there to witness so they couldn't lie about it. And we brought those records to the United States government. And so I remember those people. And I remember some of the ones that died afterwards through the, what they call the reign of terror. All the feds, they started oppressing our people. They said, we don't need no search warrant. We're looking for fugitives, we're looking for guns. And they just knocked that door in. That's the way all over Pine Ridge, all these districts, they went in. They heard somebody's name, that's where they went. They said, your aim, or either your aim sympathizer, they even said. All right, so it didn't matter who you were, they're looking for Indians. And so we took them on here at Wounded Knee to let the United States government know you can't treat us like this before we're our relatives lay there in the grave. One of the largest mass graves in the United States. Right here, 300 men, women, and children. First they took the guns away. And they came in early morning, they had Hotchkiss guns, automatic guns on the back of a wagon. They shot our people right down all through here. The ones that took off running, they chased them down and put their bayonet to. One was my relative, and Seaver's relative. They have a story the family used to do every powwow. They'd reenact where the soldier shoved that saber through my auntie. But yet still the child she had on her back running, that child lived. And so I want to remind our people that we've been
been through a lot through these years. Over 500 people were charged with crime during the aftermath of Wounded Knee. 500. So a lot of lawyers came from all over to help us out. And not one person was convicted, only one. Well, I see you guy. He's a good man. His name is Al Cooper. He wasn't scared to know what he chose. Mm. We used to call him Honky Killer. Because he used to like to kill honkies, he said. But, uh, yeah, he was, he was a good man. My brother Russell, Dennis, Carter, Clyde. All these guys were the leadership. They're the ones that brought us here. And uh, I remember I have a memory that's clear as day. I walked into that training post, I tell my, my brother, Pedro, he's handing out guns out of that. I said, oh, shit, here, we're going to get it on now, man. And the police, they took off. Pretty soon, we were surrounded all the way around. But we had an area up there, we even named it the DMZ, De Debilitized Zone. That's where we held the meetings. Well, we had half women, half men, elders, not just anybody off the street, but elders that represent the different communities on the reservation. They're the ones that made the decision. What did we do? Well, most time we came out, we had to say we're staying, because we want you to have, a, talk to us about treaty rights. Talk to us about this land in the Black Hills that's not for sale. Oh. And so out of that came the leadership we have nowadays. And the idea of the Black Hills are not for sale. That's where it started. I mean, it didn't start there, but that's where it was given a new life. New life because we can't sell the Black Hills land. That's our land. That's our history. That's our creation story comes from there. You can't sell your soul to the devil for a few hundred thousand or something. All we're going to get. Even the words of one of our chairmen, his name was Elijah Willowin Horse. He said, if we sell the Black Hills, all we're going to have is enough for an old used car and a bag of groceries and a case of beer. That's it. Don't sell it. So ever since then, we've been saying that. Our elders told us, don't sell the Black Hill. That's where we come from. That's our creation story. So remember that when you hear that, that's just a, a fantasy. We're not going to sell that ever. We can't. All these, all these young people here, they know that. They grow up hearing that. So they're not going to sell nothing. Sometimes we get this uh, COVID money checks, we get lease checks, we get a check for this and that. But none of it is in Black Hills. They took so much money and minerals out of the Black Hills already, they can't pay us back. They owe us too much already. Think how much gold they took. Three or four trillion dollars, they said. So, we got to start there, reparation for all the war that they brought to us, for all the deaths of our people, some laying right over here. we got to remember those. And so I thank all of you for coming. And every year we come here, it's kind of like a fountain of youth. We come here to get strong and stay strong and, uh, you know, to pass this on to the young people. That's the most important. I feel very confident about our young people. Because all my nieces and nephews, they know these stories. They know who's the relatives that served here, that came here to Wounded Knee, that went to the trials to help us, the elders. Who's growing them used to load up on buses, go all the way to St. Paul to back the boys that's going on trial. Go all the way to Sioux Falls, Rapid City. One time we had four different courthouses going at once, putting our people on trial. One was at Minneapolis, one was at Sioux Falls, 
One was in Deadwood. One was in Rap City. Another one was in Lincoln, Nebraska. So that's five of them we had going at once. 500 people were charged with crime. So that's the things I remember. And out of that result, up on the hill here, we have Philly Radio. We asked the people, what do you want? We want a clinic of our own, not an IHS. We want our own clinic. We want a radio station so we can speak our language. We can talk to each other. We can have our programs, give out the information. And so it took us 10 years to 1983. We went on the air here. First Indian owned radio station, independent of any tribe. It was built by volunteer labor. Our people came forward, carpenters, people that knew about plumbing, people that knew about electricity. They built that place, it's still there. And through all these years now, we got almost off the grid. We got a wind turbine up there that spins. You guys see that? We got some uh, solar panels. So we're almost paying for our own electricity through alternative energy. Ah, uh, so little by little, we've been trying to progress. And the AIM babies start to grow up. They built places like Thunder Valley. They became part of what's called Land Back. They still have demonstrations. Pretty soon we're gonna have Return of the Thunder where everybody goes up in the Black Hills. We have sun dances almost every community. These are the things that we're able to revive. We didn't start nothing. We just listened to the elderly people. So we gotta learn how to do that again. How do we listen to the elders? It takes a while to learn how to do that. Some of our elders, they don't want to get involved. But I think of Fustro, how old he was, Matthew King, you know, these bad cops, all these people that came forward, stepped in the... So when it came time to end, nobody wanted to leave. They said, we're going to stay. But Fustro came after they killed Buddy Lamont. Fustro said, he said, that's enough now, he said. We got your message about treaties, about the Black Hills. And we're going to live with that. We're going to work on those things. He said, all of you that came from somewhere else, he said, take what you learned here. The sweat lodge, the ceremony. Take them back to your home community, where you come from. Start to save the water, save the land. Fight for those things in your home reservation. That's what Fool's Crow said. So he sent everybody off with a message from the people. So for that reason, we had some great leaders that passed on. I remember uh, Mike Belcar once he said, Today is the end of the month. The rent is due, he said. And so whatever we do, you have to pay the rent, he told the United States. Pay the rent. Rent is due. And Russell Means, what did he say? He said that, remember the sun dance. Remember those ceremonies that they taught us, fools growing up. That all the traditional people, they saved our language. You got to thank them. Every time you hear that beautiful language, you thank somebody or remember for using it every day. Now they're teaching it in school. And so at least we came a little ways far since 1973. So I want to say that much on the behalf of our brothers and then I gotta say another word about Crow Dog because he's the one as our spiritual leader here. He confronted the United States too, but he confronted them with the sweat lodge, with the ceremonial waves. We had ceremonies in here every day. We had sweat lodge. One time they were shooting at the sweat lodge. We came out, we found all kind of bullets and stuff in the ground. And here nobody got hurt inside. How'd that happen? So, 
Sodom, he taught us the power of the prayer. Him and Fools Crow and the elderlies, that's what they taught us. If you stick by the traditional ways, if you stick by the language of the Lakota, we'll survive just like we did. Oh, it's a